Afternoon, everyone. Hope you enjoyed your um, your lunch. Um, so as uh, Dean mentioned, I'm a software engineer working for Wargaming Sydney. Um, I'll start with a few little housekeeping things. If people can save questions um, to the end and make certain that your phones are all on silent so we don't end up with people receiving calls throughout the, the um, talk. So of all of my submissions, this was the one that managed to make it into to conferences. I just had to be a little bit controversial to, to get talks accepted. Um, so I've been working on server technology for the past six or seven years, um, including the big world technology that's used to power uh, many of Wargaming's titles. So let's just dig into a small little survey to, to start off the, the day. So I've done this survey online. I've posted on Reddit and on sort of various other things just to try and get an idea of where people stand in terms of, of globals. Um, so I'll do a, a quick... First off, I'll start. Who is willing to put their hand up? Can I get a show of hands? It's a bit bigger participation than the last audience I did this to. It seemed no one wanted to do anything. <laughs> um, so uh, I will just go through each of these first and then sort of we'll get a show of hands of where people feel that they land on their usage of, or when they feel global acceptable to be used. Um, so never, they should be banned from the language or only used for, for constants, so only things that are set once during initialization and they're at compile time. Um, almost never. Only as, as a workaround for a sort of poor API or shortages within the languages, so sometimes reflection, sort of test case discovery sort of stuff. Uh, rarely, so only very limited use cases, sort of logging, file systems, other platform related things. Um, occasionally, so used, um, there's always something that exists that being global will make it a little bit easier for development. So event dispatches, thread pools, IO, um, other sort of things that some of that gets a little bit more into sort of uh, application specific and domain specific things. Um, so can I get a show of hands of where people, people that would believe that global should be used never? Now we've got three, uh, almost never. It's even a smaller group, rarely. Yeah, looking like we might get the majority in rarely, occasionally. Do you think they're really starting to win this with a bit on the occasional? I fall a little bit in between rarely and occasionally I do. Um, <coughs> So out of the results that I get from doing this same online survey, we ended up with sort of a, a lot of rarely and a lot of occasionally with sort of bit smaller groups for the, um, the almost never and never. So very close to sort of the audience here, uh, a little bit more in the almost never was. So now I'll dig into a little bit what I work on. So that's primarily being game engines that has, so that's... Um, so the goal of a game engine is to make it easier and more efficient to build games by focusing on the game related, by allowing the game developers to focus on game related concepts um, and not the technology that's surrounding it. Um, during the time when I've been working with game engines, I often notice that many game engines have lots of global variables within them and other forms of globally accessible state. Um, these global variables are often targeted towards game developers not specifically the engine developers themselves. Um, to me, sort of moving into that sort of thing with game development seemed very counterintuitive as I was um, I sort of of the thought that global variables, if I see those, those are a big code smell and just something that's going to be fraught with issues and if you design your software properly, you shouldn't have any global variables at all. Um, but then when looking at the problems that the game developers had, Global variables weren't even on the radar. They weren't even something that was impacting their, their development. In fact, they were being used to empower the um, empower rapid development and prototyping for the game developers. Um, this led me down the, the rabbit hole of exploring why this is the case and trying to define some boundaries and rules for when global variables might be acceptable. Well, so I'll get into a little bit of the, the agenda of the, the talk. So. So I'll go through sort of various different locations where globals are used. So globals are everywhere. You can't avoid them. You're probably already using them. Um, some of those you um, 
you should use some of those. You might be using some of those a little bit sort of dangerous usage. Um, other tools that people use in place of global, so things like um, dependency injection, things like that, issues with global, so um, initialization ordering and things like that, and then just some basic guidelines of if you're going to use a global, when you should use that global and what you should do before you sort of pull it in. Um, and then just a little bit of time for questions at the end. Okay, so let's dig into um, why you're already using globals. So some of them are unavoidable. There's a committee that decided globals are going to exist in your life already. So let's take a look at some of those. So we've got C out, C error, C log. They're all globals. If you've written a Hello World application, you're probably using one of those. You've got locales that are stored, so you've got various different things where you can change this global state that sort of impacts things. Some of this is not nice when you don't realise that someone else is changing that state and everything's going wrong. So these are one of those globals that exist in the language that not always a fan of, but they're there. There's a committee that decided they're going to be there. We've got error code, which is a new thing in C++11. Um, so it, the error categories, those need to be a, a global variable that's always accessible. So generic category, system category, actually just return a reference. They do. And that reference is then used and stored within the error code. So for those to exist, they've got to be globally existing. And then get, er get last error. And then, again, that same error node that was just in the last slide, that's another global variable. It is. In order to use some of these functions that exist, some of them return things back through um, error no. So more global variables to deal with. Want to use futures. So some of this sort of, there's global state behind it that's backing it, even though you're not working directly with a global variable. But if you use, say, set value at thread exit, something needs to hold on to that till the thread exit. So there's global things there holding onto that, doing that operation once it's finished. You've got new things like the polymorphic allocators. So set default resource, you pass in a, um, a pointer to a, um, a memory resource that will be used for the default resource for PMR. And that, um, that it's a global. Need to be a global if you're using it. And then let's get into some of these things where you, it's not the committee picking it, but it's sometimes sort of things that you would pick and things that you might want to pick to enable the developers working your code base to, um, to use. So, so that's why giving the guns to your developers can make their life a little bit easier. So we've all seen magic numbers. This is often that one of, yep, those globals always accepted. While pi, I'm pretty sure it exists in the standard. It's sort of just an example here of sort of defining a, a magic number so then you can reuse that elsewhere. Reflection, so we need a show of hands of people that use unit test frameworks within C++. That's most people. I would have it a guess that pretty much all of those unit test frameworks have some global variable behind them automatically registering test cases. They do, so within this, sort of I've tried to highlight the, um, the parts where the global variable exists, so we've sort of got this tests variable that exists that's global variable, when it picks up that sort of test case macro, it's going to add tests into that test case macro, into that um, that global test state. There's a little bit of a hacky version of it to try and keep it small for a slide, but there are other things that need global state tracked. Logging, so some people end up creating a global logger that can be used from anywhere. So here's just an example of a, a global logger it's called log, it's log.console that'll output to, to somewhere. So that's another useful global variable that you can have. So that way your, your developers can start logging things from everywhere. Otherwise, you might be passing that logger around. You might have multiple instances of a logger, and then how do they relate to each other? Um, so again, it depends on the design of your application for how you want to do that logging. But using a global variable should be perfectly acceptable for doing that. File system. So some applications, like a, a video game or something, might have sort of a, a virtual file system. It might, or other sorts of applications where you want that sort of 
file system or some other platform specific um, abstraction. And file system, when you look at it, that's global state. When you're storing something to a disk, it's pulling it back out. It's not quite in the memory, but it's in the disk that you're sort of reading and writing things. This is sort of a, a file system that you can access from anywhere, use it anywhere. The other nice thing about this is if I wanted to change raw file system to be some other type, if I'm referencing that global, I can change that type and recompile and all of the, the code that's referencing that file system will just use that new type, which can be seen as a good thing or a bad thing depending on, on who you're talking to. Okay, so event dispatchers are sort of the, the main loop sort of approach that um, that some applications are some things that are long-lived applications. You want sort of a loop sitting there processing events. So those could be things like processing inputs from the user, processing inputs from the network. Um, so this is just a small example of sort of an event dispatcher of um, processing. Um, it's got two functions on the event dispatcher it does. So it's just got a wait for operation. This is one that's just going to wait for a specific length of time. The future in there will be completed. Post operation, which will just automatically compute, complete those futures. With this future, just to simplify the design, it's not a SD future, it's a specifically designed future for this slide, where it will be completed and the, um, the completion callback will be called within the, the thread that the event dispatch is running on, which is the main thread. And we'll also, with that, we can sort of use that, wait for 100 milliseconds, and then print message saying 100 milliseconds later. Then that same sort of thing you could use within coroutines, sort of wait for a specific thing and do a co wait whenever we might get coroutines or however they end up in the, the language and what they look like. But just sort of some of the possibilities that um, you can do if you've got that object that you can use from anywhere, then you don't have to be worried about, oh, I've got to pass my main loop around here, there and everywhere, or I've got to pause it here and then resume it somewhere over here and of all of these other things where you've got to pass around that same state. Configuration variables. So you might just want some config options there that you can just tweak on and off. Um, so either enable or disabling via the debugger or so that's within the watches window within Visual Studio or within sort of um, GDB tweaking those values depending on how you want to do it. If you've got a, a global variable, you can turn those off and on as you need or as you desire. Um, you can also sort of hook up other things to do that at runtime also. Um, some of these, it does depend on what you're sort of wanting to expose, whether you really want that global or not. Um, so be a bit careful with some config, infra config options like this, making them purely global. You can at the same time just make them a, a file local global if you want. You might want a global application. You might say so if you've got just an example, sort of a word processor or something like that. Um, so you might have sort of some sort of auto save option that you want to trigger um, whenever you're about to do something that's a little bit dangerous, something that might break, um, break whatever the current state is or, or something like that. So if we've got sort of about to call some untrusted API, if we've got a global app, we can just global app, auto save. Um, if we want to throw up a warning, yep, global app, throw up some warning. Um, it depends on the, t the sort of design of your application for how you might want to communicate those things. But a global application is sort of one of those designs that some people will use to try and um, sort of do that. It does end up a little bit like a God object if, if you're not careful. Um, so something to watch out for. Uh, reflected configuration. So you might sort of want um, sort of a config option that could be filled in at, um, at init time or just post main, sort of reading for some config file or something else that you know you're not going to touch it before that's read. Um, again, you'd, that's one of those things with globals you might not know when it's initialized, but you need to design your code sort of around some of those assumptions if you do use globals. So be a little bit careful with some of this config stuff. You do have other globals that might depend on that, that config. So this is just an example config template class that you just specify a name and a string that could read from a, a file somewhere. 
Um, so I've seen these sort of things used in a, a few different applications, and also not just config some command line arguments I've seen done in a similar sort of approach. Metrics are another thing that's very sort of similar pattern of just a, a value there that you just sort of got that global thing that'll be pushed out to something that's handling the metrics. Could be pushed out into another global object. Um, again, some of the design of these things, if you're really thinking about using a global for it, think about the dependencies in between them and the initialization order. Um, so it's just an example of sort of packet lost, packet resent, incrementing and decrementing some of those. Another common use that I've seen with globals is profilers. So sometimes you want sort of a, to be able to do intrusive profiling. So adding sort of a little markup of start and end of a, a function and you don't want to sort of be passing that profiler around and then only sort of enable it when you, um, when you're actually needing to use it. So if you've got a global profiler then you've got sort of that global state there, the global function to sort of start and end those those scopes. Um, so with this profile, it's got a begin begin function and end function that um, that you call to start and end of a scope, and then sort of just a profile scope in here that you're passing a string, and that'll be stored in there. Not the most efficient profile of design here, but just an example of sort of showing how that um, that sort of global profiler can be useful to to developers to work with. Shared libraries, so often with a shared library, you only have one instance of that shared library loaded. There is some ways of loading them multiple times, but not something very common. So you might wanna just put that in a global and then have it sort of loaded at runtime, loaded during that static init time and then closed at the end of that and load those symbols up. Um, so I haven't, haven't really seen this pattern used too often, but it's an interesting approach to sort of um, get those functions out there and get them exposed. It also means that if you wanted to sort of change some of these functions and sort of um, add a little bit of a, a layer in between what's actually in that DLL, you can sort of change those things uh, more easily within there. Um, so you use a third party library. So this is sort of a Python C API. It's got global state behind it that's sort of used for the current error state within um, the exception state and error state within Python. So sometimes you're bound by sort of another third party library that's already using those global variables. So pi error occurred, checks if the exception is raised, pi error print will then use that global exception state. So yeah, sometimes you've sort of got those things that already exist that you're, um, that are forced on you to use by a third party. Um, so. Now getting into a little bit more of the, the dangerous zone of things that I wouldn't particularly use, but um, they're things that you can do with globals, things that I've seen used with globals, and um, yeah, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, so one example that you can sort of use with globals if you've just got, say, a, a list of entities or something, you've got reference them by ID and just get back a an entity handle, so with this, some people use sort of weak pointers or something like that, but you could just have a, a, a um, unordered map with just the ID that you're fetching things in and out of. Um, again, I probably wouldn't do this approach, but it is an approach that some people will take. Um, you might wanna track some info per stack frame. So he's sort of a, a little class that will sort of add, um, add extra info in for each stack frame. So we've got sort of this stack metadata um, structure that will automatically um, add metadata into a, um, into a little global metadata class and then pop that back out once it's, um, once it's finished. So this could allow us to say, have a global, a, a stack metadata that's just got frame number within there and then that'll add that extra thing in whenever you do a log out from that and that could go through multiple stack frames. So you can use global variables to sort of keep track of some of those extra things. Again, a little bit sort of bit iffy on this one whether it's actually a, a useful thing or a bit dangerous thing. Again, it's sort of, 
one of those things that you look at its global state. Do I or do I want to use that? Um, but the debug info can be useful to the developers, to the users. Um, so pick and choose these things, but always think sort of well before using them. Um, command line arguments. So while I would normally sort of process the command line arguments directly straight in main, um, sometimes I've seen approaches where sort of you've got the command line arguments as more of a global thing that you can sort of check if it has a command line argument here and then sort of be able to sort of verify command line arguments from anywhere and check whether they're, they're what you expect. Um, you can even, this is one that could be a little bit unexpected to, to people. So because, so when you actually go to use a variable, it depends on the scope that you're in for what variable will be used. Um, so this is sort of a, a tricky one here where we've got a global console logger called log and then inside of this entity class we've got another log variable called log, so exactly the same name that's referencing the outside logger that is and within our global function if we call log.console that'll call that global one, if we call the entity one, it would call it within the entity scope that log.console we'll call the entity one. So they're two, the code looks the same inside of the function, but you're ending up with different scopes for where that's called. Um, again, it's a little bit messy, a little bit confusing. So if you're going to use this, probably well and truly think about whether it is the, the right thing. It's a little bit like that metadata that you can sort of add in per scope. You could do similar sort of thing with this. Um, but yeah. A little bit iffy, I'm not certain that I would use it in a code base, but it is out there in the wild that the people have used. Um, so I'll just go through sort of some of the other um, tools that some people use uh, instead of global variables. Um, so some of these approaches of avoiding global variables I found end up with a little bit worse code in, um, in some situations, a little bit harder to read than just put a global variable in there and then work through the, um, the issues that might occur. So one alternative to, um, to global variables is having sort of a, a context object that you pass around and use to construct, um, construct your objects. So with the context objects, there's sort of two different approaches that I've seen with that, sort of I'll separate them out to explicit and implicit um, context object. So an explicit one is where the um, the context object actually has a direct list of each um, each object that exists within that context object. So here it's just loggers. Um, so within the first um, context struct, it's actually just a holding onto the value of a, a logger, so it owns the logger. Second one holds a reference to a logger, and then third one down the bottom is returning a reference, we don't know if it holds onto it, we don't know what the lifetime of any of those are. Um, so one of the things with the, this approach compared to, um, to globals is that the, um, the lifetime of the references can outlive, outlive the lifetime of the, um, the members if they're not using a, a shared pointer or something to ensure that that object um, exists and that includes the, the context itself. So the context might go out of scope or the, the logger might go out of scope. Um, it requires that all members of that context be available um, regardless of the usage. So if you're using this and you're going to write some unit tests and that unit test depends on sort of the object you're constructing depends on one of those context objects, you need everything in that context object even if it might not get used. Um, and then if something changes in that context object, you don't need to rebuild um, everything in that context object unless of course you're using sort of forward declares and using a reference within there. Um, if the pointers aren't references and they're sort of, if, they're, if it's pointing to something that isn't a reference, so it's a pointer or something, then you're going to need to do null checks every time you want to use something out of that context object. Again, it's just another object to pass around um, you're just passing around this global state that still ends up globally throughout your application um, if you're not careful using a context object. Um, another thing that sort of 
commonly cited with global variables that the owner and owner ownership and usage of global objects, you don't know who's using what. So from a header file, you can't tell who's actually using your logger or something like that. With a context object, if you're passing that in to construct the object, you don't know if the logger gets used, you don't know if the logger gets held onto. It's all very much dependent on what they're actually doing because you're not passing a logger, you're passing a context. Um, so one of the sort of potential benefits of a context of global variables is that only those objects in the context should be used within that scope if you don't have other global objects or don't use anything the standard provides globals or some other third party provides globals. So implicit context objects. So this is where sort of you've got a um, got a, a context object. You can sort of this should have template T above that T get. Um, it's just a template function that you can get a type out. Um, it'll return it. So the uh, small little example there up in the dot points, I don't know if everyone can read those, um, but just doing a context get with a, a logger type. Um, with these, the, the lifetime management becomes a bit harder, so it's a bit hard to sort of see, is there only one ownership of that type? Is there multiple ownership? And then what about if you've got two things of the same type you want sort of accessible globally? Um, it's unclear if the variable is available or not. Uh, so it always requires checking if it's returning a, um, a pointer and not just a reference. So if it's a reference, you should be safe to assume, assume that it always exists. But then is it constructing it behind the scenes or is it just an assert somewhere that it's going to fail? Does it throw an exception? Um, and yeah, as I mentioned before, inability to work with multiple objects. So if we've got sort of a, an O stream that we want sort of globally accessible, so C out, C error sort of thing. You can't really have those if they're just a, um, a generic O stream. And potentially a more expensive lookup because now you need to look through the list of things that are constructed. You've got to check whether they're alive, construct them, um, things like that. The dependencies of the items in the context have their own initialization order of things. So if you're not sort of populating that context initially and you're sort of just fetching them and constructing them as it is, the lifetime issues still exist for, for these, potentially even worse. Um, and dependencies on, um, uh, what was, whereabouts was that? Yeah, so dependencies within them get a bit messy. Um, debugging the lack of the sort of the presence of an object, if it is something that is constructed or something that needs to be placed into the context initially can get very painful because you've got to find out where it's constructed, find out where it gets stored, and that could end up anywhere. Uh, where are we the global? That's constructed pre-main, it's going to exist once main is hit. Um, so ownership and usage of the, um, the members within it is unknown for the interface again. So if you look at a header file and you're passing in one of these contexts, you don't know what it's using in that context. It could be using a logger, it could be using a file system, it could be using some other random thing. So again, it's sort of that same sort of issue that you end up with um, with globals if that's your fear of globals. So another alternative that I commonly see is dependency libraries. So you're sort of looking a little bit at um, Boost DI. So I'm not a big fan of dependency injection libraries. Um, so again, this is just Picking a specific example, it's hard to read because it's Boost DI, it's not, not my choice. A little bit my choice. I did pick an example, but it's a simple example. So here we've got sort of a, we want two things that we want to inject. We want to inject standard log and a, a standard error, we do. So, because those are the same type that we want to inject, we want to inject an O stream we need to actually create a global variable to name those things. So we end up with global variables for those. Then we've got to do this named thing to sort of specify them within the constructor for it to, to construct our test class. And then we've got to bind them based on that global name, bind them to that other object, and then finally create them. So there's quite a bit of code there just to get SD out, SDC out and SDC error. It is. So from these, um, 
So it's a little bit similar to the sort of implicit construction of objects. So it's unclear if the, the, um, the variable is available. So it always requires checking. So we could go to fetch error and then we might not have added error in there, so that might, might fail. That might. Um, the, um, the inability to have multiple objects of the same type without fiddling. So we had to fiddle around a bit here just to get C error and C, C out within it. And you might have already gone and added C out in there and then suddenly you're wanting to add C error later and like, oh, I didn't name that one. Now I've got to go back through and update everything to, to add it in there to name it. Or create a specific type for it and then fiddle around with it that way, wrap in. Um, so they can be more expensive lookup, they can. So they've got to find those objects. Um, dependency of items within dependency injection libraries can also have their own initialization ordering issues. The syntax I find quite awful and hard to read. Uh, it's another object to pass around, um, depending on how you use the dependency injection library. Uh, some people will try and do it all within main and then to worry about it later or within specific areas. Um, so the ownership and usage of members is unknown from the interface, it is, so it's not always um, clear from those. And sometimes the dependency injection library initialization can be a little bit easier because you've got those dependencies there that you're passing into each, each thing as you construct it. But that depends on how you use the dependency injection library. And then another, not quite an alternative, but sort of something along a sim similar vein, singletons. So, so commonly cited, yeah, singletons are much worse than, than global variables, but sometimes a singleton might be a little bit better than a global variable in some situations. Rarely, but, but they do exist. Um, so you might just want a specific console logger, so you don't have multiple consoles, and you want to just explicitly log to that that console, console being sort of um, say SD out or something like that, or more more specific where you've got sort of only a specific console. So if you're going to use a singleton, be absolutely certain that it will never have another one that exists. Um, so one of the benefits of a singleton is that it enforces that only one item exists. There's no room for conflict or duplication of that that same object. Um, so strongly enforcing that type as, as the one being used. Um, one of the things that if you're going to use a singleton, ensure that it can't be moved, copied, constructed multiple times. Otherwise it be, defeats the purpose of constructing one. So don't have a singleton that is also the ability to construct it and move it and copy it elsewhere because that's not gonna be fun for anyone to go through. Okay, so. Go through some of the issues with globals. So it's not all not all rainbows and, and lollipops. There is is some issues that exist with globals, and there is some solutions to, to some of those issues and some some little approaches to um, to help work around some of the problems. It is um, so one of the issues with um, global variables that's often cited is locality reasoning. So within this block code, we've just got an object that we're accessing socket, call and connect on it. Within this, can anyone tell me where socket lives? With locality reasoning, if we ban globals, does it change that? No, because it can still be, it could be on the stack, it could be inside of object, it could be, could be a global, it could be a reference to any one of those other locations. So look at a variable, you don't know where it lives. Um, you want to sort of, if you're concerned about sort of locality reasoning and things like that, then um, I'd recommend using naming conventions to sort of make it clear what is, what is a global, what is local variable, what's argument passed in, what's something that's living on the stack, and then also sort of whether it's a reference to something else or whether it's where it actually lives, um, if the lifetime of it is important. Um, so other solutions to that might be sort of taking advantage of the IDE and some of those will have sort of It'll mouse over and it'll tell you where it is or it'll have a different sort of um, highlighting depending on where it actually lives. Said. Locality reasoning, I don't think it's a good excuse to say no globals. 
Nine space conflicts. So nine space conflicts can exist with everything. They're not just specific to global. So here, got two files. One of them has a, a global integer named global, and then a function just named func. Um, both of them are defining a, a body for that function. So all symbols can cause conflicts with it, within. Um, so if you've got a function, a, a member function, a class, like all, all of these things can have conflicts if you're if you're looking at names. So global variables, they're not unique in this. Um, I recommend to avoid this. You should generally try and put everything within a namespace. Um, so then you've got the name is unique to that namespace. A little bit of an exception to that is when you're using sort of X turn C, and then if we were to put these two things in a, two different namespaces, X turn C, they would still be the same object. Um, so in order to work around that, you might need to prefix the variables based on what it is, but hopefully you don't have to deal with any code that's X turn C. Um, initialization ordering. So one of those things that's commonly cited is the initialization ordering fiasco. So we've got two, two global variables. One of them depends on the other. The order of that initialization depends on the, the translation unit that it's in, so the CPP file. So the order in between different CPP files, none of that's known. That can be randomly one than the other. Um, but within one translation unit, Everything that's uh, in that translation unit will be initialized from top to bottom. It will. So if we've got, um, got say, a logger and a file system, they might be in different header files that we sort of define the extern for those two variables. But if you put that all in one global's um, CP file, you can initialize the file system, ensure that it's initialized first, then the logger, and then put that dependency in there for the um, the logger. So yeah, trying to keep all the, um, the initialization together within one CVP file is what I would recommend. Um, and yeah, avoid using globals inside of other things that might become globals at some point. Um, so if it's going to be something that has a chance of being a global anywhere, then don't use globals within it. Try and have it something that you sort of inject that dependency via the constructor. Concurrency, so this is one of those other things that is, with a, with a global, it does become a little bit unclear for whether it's going to be thread safe or not. Um, so concurrency issues will exist regardless of the, the shared state and how it's shared. Global, global variables do make it a little bit easier to, to share that state because once it's global, if someone, someone's using a different thread, they can access it. You're not restricting them on anything. Uh, so it's one of the dangers there. One of the things that you can rely on is that um, globals will be um, safer threads. So you, a global, um, global should exist prior to the thread starting. They should, so they should be initialized before main. They should already exist. Um, and then globals will not be destroyed before the end of your thread. So that lifetime issue when you're passing sort of something into a thread and when it's destroyed can get a little bit hairy if you're just using a standard variable or a reference to another variable. Um, if your application is multi-threaded, then you should typically try and make all your global variables thread safe. Um, or if you're only expecting the global to be used from a single thread, um, then add the necessary checks to ensure that it is. Um, so depending on your global variable, one approach to this might be making sort of that global um, variable a thread local. So that'll make it unique per thread. So that's a bit like the um, the profiler, where the profiler, even if it was global, you if you're adding things from sort of um, multiple different threads, it's going to get out of order. So the thread local is beneficial for it to for multiple reasons. Um, but it's one approach. It depends on the global variable that you're using. Testability is one of those things where it is a big impact. So the two, two things to primarily think about when dealing with a global variable, concurrency and testability. Um, the impact on testing depends highly on the purpose of the global variable and where it is used. So I've sort of tried to define some basic guidelines of, um, of where, you use, where you want to add a global variable. 
and sort of some general usage of what you can do to try and reduce the impact of that testing. Um, so I've tried to categorize a few different types of global variables. Um, so static init registration, so this is things like that, um, that sort of reflection for finding tests or other reflection systems which sort of just build up a list pre-main. You're not changing that list at all after main. Um, so the impact on testing for those should be fairly minimal. Unless of course you're changing that state somewhere afterwards. Um, so using those within your core libraries and your applications and application related libraries, you should be reasonably safe to do. I mean, you do want to use your, your unit test frameworks, even if they do contain some globals. Um, debugging and monitoring related things. So this is sort of your loggers and your profiles and stuff like that. Um, using them within your core libraries, sometimes those things will actually have dependencies and other stuff, so they will commonly live in a core library. Um, so if you're using them in there, be very careful when using a, a global variable version of them. It, within sort of an application library, you should be reasonably free to, for you, to use those. Um, I should just reiterate with this, I've sort of divided up libraries into sort of your core libraries, so these are things that sort of add things on like similar to the, the STL or sort of other core things that your application will depend on. Then application libraries which are a little bit more application sort of logic stuff to support the application and then the application itself. Um, so yeah, just sort of continuing on for that debugging and monitoring. Um, so in the application you should be able to use debugging and monitoring. Configuration, it's very much sort of similar usage, so it's impact for testing. If you're not changing that configuration within your, your tests, it should be fairly minimal. Um, again, with the core library, everything's a bit if you can use it in there, but be very careful with using anything that's global or sort of will be initialized by something else for your core library. That's probably the thing that you're wanting to ship out and and redistribute and reuse elsewhere, so I might want different configuration approaches for that. Uh, environment and platform related things. Um, so these, the impact on testing is a little bit higher um, because, again, you're playing with things within the environment that will change their state, that will impact testing. Um, a lot of the time when you're testing things that are related to that state, they're probably more in the sort of core libraries if you're dealing with sort of file system related things or even command lines or other other stuff like that, um, IO streams, then probably avoid using any, um, any environment or platform related stuff. Application libraries, your tests are probably a little bit more lenient in, in using some of those, but it should be very rare that you would write a test for that. You might mock some of that stuff instead. Um, and within the application, typically the application, it's probably a, a much smaller thing if you've sort of divided your application up a little bit like this, that you're probably doing more sort of um, system testing at that stage and you do want to actually hit the, the, um, the file system. Domain specific stuff, Hard to know, everyone's working in sort of different in industries and domain specific stuff is very industry specific. But with that, probably keep it to sort of the, the app and the application layers and avoid core libraries depending on that. But domain specific things probably don't exist in your core libraries. Um, so the application um, global and sort of that got object, it shouldn't exist anywhere outside of the application because that's probably where you're creating that that um, that global object. So if you're going to use one, keep it on in there. Don't try and make it exist within application libraries or within core libraries and use it everywhere. Yeah, that's just a quick overview on impact of testing for what I've seen for usage of global variables. So. Conclusion, so coming close to the end of end of my talk, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, so when and why you should use global variables. Um, so a little bit more of the, the when, so um, to with global variables, always think heavily before you're going to introduce a global variable. It's not just 
Ah, oh, I saw a talk. They said that was good to use there. It's not always good. There's many things. There is it depends on your application. It depends on who you're working with. It, so many different impact of like different things to, to think about. Um, if it's not a constant, then discuss it with your team, code stakeholders, anyone that you're going, anyone that has to work with that code that you're working with. If it's an open source project, create a uh, an, an issue ticket on it and then discuss whether that should be a global or not if you're thinking about using a global and you think that that's a, a worthwhile thing because you are changing things globally if it's a global. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Just think carefully about doing it. Um, always consider the impact of testing. This is where you can and will get hit if you do use global variables incorrectly. And then concurrency, again... That's the, the two main things, testing, concurrency. If you don't use your global variables correctly, you will get bitten by them in those two places. Um, prefer that your global variables live within namespaces to avoid conflicts or nested in a class, somewhere to sort of define that scope. Um, when I put out the survey on, um, on Reddit, got a bunch of responses and sort of one of the, the comments on there sort of I, I felt sort of was fairly nice and sort of reuse it within my talk. So global variables can be thought of as being member variables of the application. If you're not responsible for the application as an entity, you can't make anything global. That's sort of a nice little thing to live by. If you don't, if it's not yours, don't create something globally within it. And again, just reiterating, this is the exact same slide. Globals can make it hard to test. And then, final little sur survey. Um, first off, I'll do a little survey before the... Has anyone fallen asleep yet? Is everyone awake? It's still... Haven't tired anyone out? Um, so, have I convinced anyone to reconsider their usage of global? So, shifted from where they were or sort of a little bit more lenient in their, their usage and sort of not just, no, no, no globals at all or something like that. Show of hands of people who might reconsider globals within their applications. Is anyone willing to put their hands up for anything? Well, we've just got no... <laughs> still some liveliness in the, the audience, just no one that's shifted a bit disappointed. That was my goal, to shift at least a few people. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Is there any questions? Hey, thank you for the talk. Uh, I really love when we have more talks about uh, adding nuance to things that have been thought of as simple rules. Um, one of the things you said was uh, singleton's bad because uh, you have to be sure that there will always only ever be one, which I think is a nice segue into thinking about how is your system going to deal with maintenance over time, which is a thing I worry about maintaining a large code base. Um, and I think very relevant to the way that you phrased much of the talk, there's a significant difference between a global variable and global state. Like if you are accessing global state through a function, then you have a choke point that you can still maintain. Whereas if you have purely just global variable, like that global variable, you can never enforce any you can never enforce anything, right? It's just a global variable, right? Whereas if you're trying to uh, monkey patch thread safety and locking into a, a global that you know had been thought poorly, like ill thought out ahead of time, right? If you're accessing it through a function, you have a chance. If you're accessing it as global variable, you have a much harder task. And so I, I think it'd be good for you to maybe have a little bit more granularity in your discussion of global state versus global variable specifically. Yeah, Th thanks for that, that feedback. Like with global variables, like if you are just making something that's just very generic out there as a global variable, then it is probably good to think about how that will evolve, what that sort of will impact, and can you restrict it later if you need? Are you binding yourself to some interface that's going to bite you later? Mm 
Um, I have a question which is similar to the previous question. So uh, you mentioned in the talk that singleton have a lot drawback compared to um, global variable. Uh, I got the point like uh, you shouldn't really copy or move the singleton. But beside you try to maintain multiple singleton pr uh, object, which is bad anyway. It shouldn't be a singleton anyway. Can you give a, one example in the real life that uh, you making something singleton is actually worse than using global variable? Making something a, a singleton worse than making a global variable? You might, for example, want sort of a um, trying to think of, like your. A logger. So if you if you've got a logger, you might want sort of something that's sort of able to log data, and that that logger you might sort of specify a, a file into it to something, and if you you might have most of the application that wants to log out to sort of um, one specific location. So you just I, I'll make a singleton logger. Everything can log into that, but what you might find is that then oh I want to actually do a little tweak for that logger and I want this area not to use the global logger, to use another logger, and then sort of have little tweaks in that. That way you've sort of got that ability to create multiple loggers, even if your main one, which could have been a singleton, is only used. Um, so you, the, the main one that could have been a singleton, if it's a global, you can still use that same type elsewhere. So it's mainly that, that type, if it's a, a singleton, shouldn't be used anywhere else. Yeah. You can just run a global logger and get rid of singleton. And if you want a logger for a specific task, then you just have another logger there. Yeah, if, if you wanted the logger to be part of a, a singleton, you would probably have to create a, a specific singleton just for that logger. You would. So that you, you if you're wanting a logger that is singleton, so for example, that console logger, then you wouldn't have the ability to instantiate multiple ones of that console logger. You wouldn't, so it's... Well, it's sort of one of those things that... So the console logger is a little bit different to, say, a standard logger. You might have an iLogger interface or something like that that, that you're working with. So having it as, as a global means that you can change that logger. So you might be, oh, yeah, I'm outputting the console, I have a singleton console, then later on, oh, wait, now we want to do some automated sort of things and we actually want our logs to not go out to a console, we want them to go out to elsewhere. Or we want to sort of submit them somewhere else and sort of if you've tied yourself down to that, um, that singleton, then you're more restricting that. Where the global, you're not quite tying yourself to a, um, a specific type. You aren't, so you're not sort of console logger get or, or whatever it is, you you're just logger dot this and reuse it. Um, how do you handle the, the um, order of initialization of uh, globals? Especially if one would depend on another. For example, the initialization of one global uses the logger, which is another global. And wouldn't I have more control with singletons there? Uh, so with singletons, it, it depends on how you're actually designing those singletons. So if the singleton is actually something where you initialize it as soon as your first use of that singleton is, the control about the order of those initialization all depends on which one gets called first. Um, for, but if it's actually sort of a singleton that's backed by a, a global variable, then the initialization depends on the translation unit those are created in, um, sort of in order to resolve some of the initialization orders with um, global variables. I recommend just create a single file that has all of your global variables in it. And that way you've got defined order of this will be initialized here, this will be initialized here. Like just one after the other, you've got those dependencies that you inject. Your list of globals hopefully won't be that big that that file looks too awful, but it will give you that control over when things are initialized. And it should hopefully make you think twice when you're adding a global variable in, am I adding this thing into this list for a good reason? I haven't run into this issue myself, but uh, I just wonder if, if you wanted to comment on the global's impact on application startup time. Yeah, so I'd, I haven't actually ran into that too much of an issue, um, but it is definitely something that can impact the startup time. And 
can make it a little bit unclear. Is it actually starting? Is it what's it doing? Depending on the sort of platform that you're working with, um, but hopefully within a global variable, it's not something that needs a lot of processing and initialization. That it is going to impact start time. If it is, then probably need to think about some sort of different approach to it. So I, I was wondering, did you consider with globals the potential impact on performance? I mean. I believe you can use global as a micro optimization to avoid uh, one potential uh, point of chasing because you know at compile time, uh, well, at link time, what address your global is going to be at. Yeah, so that, that is one of the benefits that when you are using that global variable, that where it lives is known. And you also don't end up sort of growing these objects, trying to pass around, say, a logger from one to the next, and everything's holding onto its own logger, and every object gets larger and larger. Um, so that way, with with globals, you do get a little bit a bit of that optimization. But I don't think you should be picking globals specifically for optimization. But it is one of the benefits that you can get out of it. Thanks for your talk. Are you aware of the CPP core gu guidelines that are currently being evolved? Yep, yeah, I've looked at those. I haven't looked at them specifically relating to globals. Okay, with regards to globals, it says avoid using non-const globals. And with regards to singletons, it just outright says avoid using singletons. Um, in my experience, singletons can be quite tricky. I've had circular instantiation of classes through singletons which call other singletons and it just gets a real mess. Yeah, singletons do get a little bit like that. That's where, with the globals, when you've got sort of this single file, that dependency should be a little bit more clear. Um, I would say that if you're forced to use globals, you should use data hiding. That enables you to put everything through an interface, which means you are sure who is calling it. If it's a naked variable, it's very easy not to know who's using it. Yeah, that's I didn't quite cover in, in this, so with this... Um, to say with this example, that logger could be an I logger reference, and then you could have within the um, the global CMP the actual instance of that that global being console logger or whatever it is that then points to the reference of that logger. So that way you've got that interface there hmm. you're working with, and not the actual implementation. Uh, you express concerns around lifetime of objects. One of the other things the core guidelines does refer to is making it a lot of use of um, unique pointer and shared pointer and only using those for passing around uh, ownership and life, lifetime issues. Any other use should be a raw pointer or a reference. So if you're following those um, guidelines, then if you see a pointer or a reference, then you can just use the object. Yeah, with a, with a pointer, you still need to check whether that's actually a, a valid pointer or not. Um, a reference, you can assume that you should be able to use it. Um, but then you do get some, depending on the code base that you're in, someone where it's stored a reference to a variable within a member. No, sorry, so standard library unique pointer and standard library shared pointer are two facilities offered which replaced auto pointer in C++11. Yeah, so the recommendation is to use those for lifetime control. Yeah, so using those for, for lifetime is useful, but if you, for example, were we're wanting to have a logger and you're wanting to sort of keep that logger alive for sort of the entire lifetime that anything might be using that logger, you're then, a unique pointer is probably not sort of the best thing for that. It isn't. So you're probably looking at a shared pointer for that because you do want to sort of ensure that it's alive. Then every time you're constructing something that might use a logger, you're having to sort of increment the count of that sort of logger. You've got everything's holding onto an instance of that logger. Um, we're with a global variable. You can be sure, like you can certain that that is going to exist as long as you're not trying to use it within something else that's a global, um, but it exists for that lifetime. There are still issues with um, teardown after main exits where certain objects may still be alive and call into the globals that are now defunct. So We'd it's still not a golden bullet or silver bullet to solve those problems. With the destruction of the objects within here, so for for this example here, the, the order of, of construction sort of 
top down and then destructions bottom up. So they, that will be absolutely certain within that, that specific translation unit. So that way you've got that clear control. It's the, like looking at a global file like this, this is essentially your pre-main um, list of things being constructed. <laughs> yeah, if we're going to talk about uh, the horrible domain of post main, um, this is, uh, there's some excellent talks from CPPCon last month uh, that talk about uh, before main and also after main. I think uh, Matt Godbolt and Greg Falcon both did those. Uh, definitely try to check those out. The big warning on that topic, I think, is uh, any unjoined threads are still running at the point that main has exited and all of your global variables are being destructed. Um, so if you have non const expert things, like, or things that have a non-trivial destructor, uh, they will be destroyed, and any non-joined thread is still merrily chugging along until you get to the very end of all of those destructors. So if you have a thread that's, say, answering network requests and storing things to you know, your database, uh, that is a recipe for super, super, super badness. Uh, there's at least an hour's worth of talk that could be given, because it was given recently, on initialization and destruction issues for globals, and I would recommend everyone tread carefully on that space. Um, I've been trying to think about how to put this as a question. Um, one of the examples where I'm using globals at the moment is I have a relatively large section of code, which I've been adding parallel algorithms to and I want to be able to control the number of threads that these different algorithms um, execute but I don't want to have to pass the configuration of the number of threads down from very high in uh, the application down to the low level of where they're actually going to be run uh, and maybe in the future I want to switch to a different uh, system like OpenMP, which would mean a different method for configuring the threads. So I have global variables that uh, allow you to set the limits on the threads high up in the code and then be read low down in the code without passing through all the signatures. Um, and I guess my question is, did I give up too early in going to threads? Is there a better way for me to be doing this? Or is this, do people feel that um, I've, I've done something appropriate in this particular case. With that, like, it's hard to know the specifics of what you actually got there and sort of, it is very case by case. Um, again, like what, it, what is the impact of, of that? So if you've got that variable there and you're tweaking it at runtime, someone might tweak it in one unit test and then sort of change it in another. So they, those are the sort of things that you need to be aware of with that. Um, so it's going to depend on the code. If it's something in isolation that you really just doing that more potentially as a constant sort of thing, is this is just a constant maximum number of threads that is running, then that's probably not too bad of an issue there. Um, so it is case by case for that and sort of, it also depends on what's the impact of trying to work around that issue. If you spend too much time working around that issue, are you potentially just creating another issue elsewhere or slowing down something else that you could be working on? Uh, so you had an example at some point uh, between different files and uh, name collisions. And I was wondering why not give those uh, variables static linkage, which leads to another thing. Isn't there a big difference between uh, local global variables, like static linkage, which are limited to the current translation unit compared to the ones that are external and accessible through the world program. Like it seems much easier to reason about a global which is guaranteed to be only ever used in the current translation unit as opposed to one that uh, could be accessed from anywhere. Yeah, so using static or anonymous namespaces to, to make that actually a, a local sort of global variable to that translation unit is probably sort of the, the way you'd go for this if that global variable isn't used outside of there. Um, the example, even though it's sort of got just a dot .cp there, the example sort of meant to also be there's a header file there that you're working with that, um, that sort of variable with and then it is more globally accessible and you do have that name collision. Um, same with a, a function. Mm 
yeah, for this example, if it was only using that file, if you've got got a global variable that isn't really global but is really just file global, then anonymous namespace or sort of a, a static variable will do. But when you're hitting that sort of thing, probably consider whether it should just be in the class itself, depending on what what the variable is that you're working with. 